Palisade Radio is brought to you by First Majestic Silver Corp., one of the world's purest and fastest growing silver mining companies. Welcome back to another episode of Palisade Radio. This is your host, Colin Cattell. On the line with us today is a new guest to the program. His name is Gianni Kovacevic. He's an author, and I just met him up at PDAC. The name of his book is My Electrician Drives a Porsche. Gianni, welcome to the program. Great to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, yeah, it's great to have you. And you just shared some great inf- uh, some great news that your book is now in uh, most, if not all, U.S. airports. Uh, you've got major distribution, and you're doing a really awesome uh, launch or tour for the book as it comes out. Uh, and you're driving a Tesla across the country for, uh, I guess it's about a month and a half, ending at Tesla headquarters, uh, hitting 25 cities. Tell us a little bit about the book. Uh, it's a very catchy title and uh, the idea of driving across the country. Yeah, thanks. Um, the book is doing very well. People can find it at, it's definitely in the retail system across America and Canada, and it it is at all major airports. Why has this book resonated with so many people? It's about a millennial electrician who enlightens his family doctor, who's 58 years old, baby boomer, lives in Seattle, about how the world turns. How, what's, what are the changes de- demographically? technologically, the, you know, there's the, the changing energy mix and what makes it all possible. And so it's a page turning adventure to absorb all of those facts and statistics. And the title, which is my electrician drives a Porsche, it's a question mark. And the doctor goes out of his mind to figure out how that's possible. He has very little to do with fast cars and a lot to do with, you know, investing in the rise of 3 billion new spending class consumers in all categories. And so to amplify the important messages in the book, I am going to be driving a electric vehicle from the east coast of the United States all the way to down to, down to Tesla headquarters, 25 cities to do TV, print, radio, media and engage with, you know, what really will should be probably some millions of people about all these messages. Now, Gianni, obviously you're a proponent of the Tesla as a, as a vehicle. Uh, I don't know if you, you own a Tesla or if you're uh, borrowing one for this trip. Uh, tell, us, tell us a bit about an electric vehicle and um, you know, obviously you see a bright future there. Uh, how, how you like driving the Tesla? Yeah, I like to tell everyone that the future is now. So I was at Harvard, MIT, and Yale just before I entered New York City here and I was talking with various students about how effective is this car? Is the future now? How long does it take to charge? And surprisingly, they were actually quite accurate on many of the things. The part where most people are wrong is how long does it take to top up this vehicle? It takes 30 minutes to top yourself up so you can continue going. And the range is about 250 miles. As an example, I drove the car from Toronto to Boston in, in one shot. It's about 600 miles, three stops, and it was no much time, no much more in time than it would have been to drive an internal combustion engine, uh, maybe maybe 15 minutes longer. So the future is definitely now. Well, Palisade Radio, we focus on the mining world. And of course, uh, an electric vehicle has a lot of different components that go into it, different commodities. There's been a whole boom in the commodity sector around graphite, uh, particularly lithium right now cobalt. Uh, and then there's also some other major metals and minerals that go into to building an electric vehicle. Tell us a bit about the future for those uh, different commodities. Yeah. And I think the, the, the segue to that is the changing energy mix, understanding the winners and the losers. Now, we talk about um, when you take fossil fuels out of the equation, it requires more electricity, you know, whether it's uh, to make electricity or to utilize that electricity. So, so yes, when you talk about an electric car, question number one is the future now, are we ready to have major adoption? The answer is, in, is definitely yes. And on Palisade Radio, Gianni, we focus mainly on the commodity sector. Of course, uh, electric vehicles have a whole set of different commodities that go in to build them. Uh, it's actually set off a bit of uh, a boom in certain of these commodities, graphite, lithium, uh, cobalt, and even some other ones that you can mention. Uh, talk to me about what goes into uh, building an electric vehicle and how you see that changing uh, the commodity sector over the coming years. Yeah, that's a great question because if we can acknowledge that the future is now and as we decarbonize the energy mix, both you know how we 
create energy, how we transfer it, and how we utilize it, there are going to be winners and there's going to be losers. So we're talking now about electric cars and how we utilize uh, this green energy. So you, if you look at a Tesla, it has about uh, 220, just over 200 pounds of copper. Um, my 85 has about 75 kilograms of lithium. There's even more graphite and there's cobalt. So these are all things that if you... If you ask yourself, are we going to have more and more penetration of electric vehicles? And I think the answer is definitely yes, you know, especially in the next sort of five to seven years. Um, my research tells me that we're going to be between 7 and 10% penetration uh, on a global scale with electric and plug-in hybrids in the next uh, five to seven years. So there's a tremendous amount of new supply. Uh, just to, as a recap, in 2015, there were about 88 million light vehicles sold. So we're talking about a lot of vehicles. And if you look at some of the um, uh, opportunities that investors have. I mean, everyone is well aware of the of the lithium boom that's taken place, and and, and there's opportunities there. The uh, one of my sponsors, which is uh, Focus Graphite, the uh, we have a project in Quebec, which is one of the highest grade graphite projects uh, anywhere in the world, and uh, they they look to also have a, a different type of chemistry within the uh, the creation of batteries, and, and a company that they have, which is called Brill Battery. And then uh, the, the, the amplitude of copper in these vehicles, this is something that's, been, that, that's totally missed in all of green energy. It takes, uh, Colin, typically four to six times more copper per megawatt of utility whether, whether, when you create, transfer, or utilize greener and cleaner energy. So in, in my opinion, copper is going to decouple from oil, which is, it, it, it's been following for about 40 years uh, price-wise, uptick, uptick for uptick and downtick for downtick. And there should be in the medium term, medium to long term, a disproportionate benefit in copper. So I think copper is one of these commodities that uh, in the end might even win the marathon. Yeah, and that's a really interesting point that you bring up. You actually did an interview on BNN a few days ago at the PDAC conference, and one of the main points you were talking about is how much copper is used uh, in green technology, electric vehicles, uh, a point that is missed by many investors. Uh, one, one question that I want to ask, and uh, this, this is a good way to lead into it, um, with more copper being needed or with solar panels, you need a lot of silver or with wind, heavy, rare earths. Uh, people don't oftentimes think about uh, the amount of CO2 that's submitted from mining these things or the amount of disruption uh, in terms of mining these minerals. Do you see a net benefit coming out of these green technologies? Is it actually better for the earth or is it simply uh, going to be cheaper ultimately than burning through fossil fuels? Well, there's, there's many things that you have to discuss there. First of all is the, the, the cost you know, and, and, and there's also the convenience. So if you look at, you know, we're way beyond breathing, you know, diesel fumes in cities and such. You know, even if, if the cost is the same, for me, it's, it's just a prehistoric way to, of, of doing mobile transportation. And so the other question of is what people are saying is about CO2 emissions. When you drive a car, you know, or create these greener and cleaner cars, it takes a lot more CO2 emissions just to make them, as you know, to, to, to mine the products. But you have to qualify that because if you're going to go continue, you know, exploring for oil, transporting it, refining it, transporting the refined product to a station and repeat every single week in perpetuity, I mean, what's the CO2 emissions in that? You know, I would rather have something that's sustainable, build it once, uh, it's going to have a useful life of, say, you know, 5 to 15 years, depending on the application, and at the same time, you live in comfort, you're not breathing these, you know, nauseous fumes. So it's, it's just a way of progress, and, and by the way, in my opinion, I'm, and I'm someone who has experience, it's a, it's a superior product. You know, the consumer at the end of the day is going to dictate what he wants to buy. And then you, you have to simply provide the, the, the building blocks to make those, those vehicles possible. That's that's a great point. And in terms of the superior product, uh, you obviously like the Tesla. We talked about this at the beginning of the interview. Uh, at this point, Tesla has really been the only major entrant into the market that's had any success. Uh, I think a lot of that's focused around Elon Musk and his ability to raise billions of dollars of capital. Uh, Tesla is not profitable yet uh, in a sustainable way. Do you see other companies coming in to compete? Uh, do you think Tesla is going to continue to lead this forward? Yeah, they don't have a choice. I think that because the, the consumer, as I noted, is going to dictate uh, what, what they want, they, they have a forces from two sides. One, you've got this, this whole CO2 emissions um, brigade around the world where people are wanting to go away from uh, fossil fuel burning. On the second side of it, you've got companies like Apple and Google that are entering the field. 
And I can assure you, many of these uh, legacy incumbent automotive makers, they do not want to go the way of Kodak Film Company or Blockbuster Video. They have to adopt. They're, they're forced to adopt. Otherwise, they're going to get gobbled up. You look at the market caps of the major technology companies against the, the incumbent automotive manufacturers, and, and there's a big discrepancy there. So it, the, it's going to happen a lot faster than people think, a lot faster. And I, I like to tell people the future is now. We are at the adoption point, and the things are happening very quickly, and we will see these, um, all the things that feed into these technologies have, uh, I think they're going to surprise a lot of people. Are you seeing a lot of the traditional companies uh, entering into the space? I, I, I know that your book's uh, titled My Electrician Drives a Porsche, and Porsche has been at least putting some concept vehicles out um, that will compete with uh, in Tesla in the coming years. Um, and then, you know, obviously GM and Ford have been putting hybrids out over the last few years, but nothing seems to compare at this point to what Tesla has done. Uh, where are you seeing kind of competition coming into the space? Is it going to be from Apple and Google before uh, Tesla really gets a good run for their money? Yeah, at the same time, I think the Porsche thing is more of a Volkswagen initiative. The redemption of Volkswagen because of this diesel gate uh, will come in some part with their acceleration of the electric vehicle program. I've been told that they'll have some 30 vehicles on offer by about 2020 within the platforms, the various Volkswagen platforms. And so uh, that's, a, that's a difficult transition for them to make. It doesn't appease their service network. It doesn't appease their dealer network. It doesn't appease the, 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 the army of people that it, within the, the, the companies that feed into them that make you know, mufflers, radiators, cranks, pistons, valves, all those things that go into an internal combustion engine, but it's happening. And, and the, the, just a note on my book, the title, you know, it, it's My Electrician Drives a Porsche, but as noted, it has nothing to do with fast cars. It, the, all that title does is make you pick the book up and be curious. And then you go down a path of enlightenment to realize that, uh, you know, all these things, there are new consumers, everything you buy comes with a cord plugged in the back of it. And, uh, you know, as we electrify the, the energy mix, the, the more there's demanded of, you know, copper. If people, when people pick the book up, they'll realize that it has this beautiful copper foil as the background. And once you've read the book, that resonates forever. You become a quasi, you know, mini expert on all these things and the common bond that puts it all together, which is copper. And I think uh, it probably wouldn't hurt to talk about a couple of uh, ideas within the copper space uh, since we're on that theme. Yeah, let's do that. Let's talk about uh, some of your uh, favorite ways for investors to get uh, into into copper. And as an extension of that, if any of the other energy metals that are interesting to you, uh, aside from Focus Graphite, you already mentioned, be happy to hear those as well. Yeah, well, first thing we recognize is technology is not the friend of the oil and gas industry. You know, there's many reasons that the price of oil will go up or down, and, and oil will have its day in the sun again, for sure. But if we talk about a 15-year horizon, you know, there is an adoption, innovation, things use less fuel. We are going to adopt things that don't use any fuel. So technology is not the friend of the oil and gas industry. Also, the way we extract oil, technology makes it possible to take oil from, from more complicated, tighter formations. So that's a two-way street. On the other side of it is copper. Technology is definitely the friend of copper because when you decarbonize the energy mix, it takes three, four, five units more copper per megawatt. And as you know, copper extraction has not had a fracking moment. So I think copper is going to have this disproportionate benefit. The, all the companies are still in the tank. The, the industry was very short you know, some weeks ago. It was at all, you know, almost at inflation-adjusted all-time lows. The global exchanges had around 3.5 million tons of, of physical copper pledged short, and you saw what happened to all the senior miners. There's been a rebound. But if you go um, three parts of the food chain, on the top part of the food chain, I like Lundy Mining. I think they've got a strong balance sheet. I think they've, they've weathered the storm. They've been able to pick up assets. I like Imperial Mining. I think they have the crown jewel of the Canadian mining industry with their Red Chris mine. Um, going down into the juniors, there's uh, Nova Copper, Rick Van Newhouse's company, which is a, a prolific high-grade uh, project in Alaska. And, you know, it's trading at about, I don't know, a a third of a penny a pound in the ground. And then, of course, I have to speak my own book uh, with a selfish interest, uh, my Copper Bank, a company I created. It was created by shareholders, for shareholders to capture the pain in the streets where we take projects, buy them, hold them on a 100% basis, and then uh, we're going to weather the storm. And we want to vehemently protect the value per share. 
So it's, a, it's an anti-dilution strategy to just have as many bulk pounds in the ground. These are not producing assets, of course. And, um, and the company is called Copper Bank. So just for, for disclosure, I'm the largest shareholder of that company and the founder and, uh, and the chairman. So just so people know. But that's, that's what I like as a basket. I think if what, what, what people were to simply follow those names uh, for education, um, I think they'll, they, won't, they, they'll, they won't be art of the wear. And um, also, you can also look at different companies that have fantastic information on their websites, you know, educational stuff. If you really want to learn about these metals like lithium and graphite uh, and cobalt, you can, um, you know, go to various sources. And one such source, is, as I mentioned, is Focus Graphite. I think they've, uh, they've done a lot of outreach and they've done a, a ton of great work to educate markets. Great. Okay. Well, Gianni, let's leave it there. Uh, For all of our listeners, the book can be found on Amazon and a host of other places called My Electrician Drives a Porsche, Investing in the Rise of the New Spending Class. Gianni, thanks so much for coming on the show, and I wish you the best of luck on your Tesla tour through the United States. Thank you. And everyone can follow me on my Twitter handle with at Realistic Enviro. Thanks for having me. Think you understand the junior mining sector and you think that the participants in the mining sector junior mining sector are good people and kind people hit the bid and the world is always going to need raw material it's going to need copper and gold and nickel and so forth totally destabilized hey hey troll did you hear what's going on in yemen are you too stupid <laughs>